Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, The Pros and Cons of Fall Fertilizer and Application, Optimizing Yields and Minimizing Losses in Tile Drain Fields. My name is Julia Freuk. I am the project coordinator here at the Partnership for Egg Resource Management and will be hosting the webinar this morning. We are joined today by my colleague, Dr. Thomas Green, president and co-founder of the IPM Institute, who will provide a brief introduction. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Lowell Gentry, principal research specialist in agriculture at the University of Illinois. Before we begin, I will go over some brief logistics. Please make use of the question box on your screen to type questions for Lowell during his presentation. I will moderate questions during the last 10 minutes of the webinar after the presentation. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available later on partnershipfarm.org. By attending today's webinar, you are eligible for 1.5 CCA continuing education units, one for nutrient management and 0.5 for soil and water management. You must be present for the entire webinar to receive those points. If you are watching this webinar live, you will receive an email in the next few days with the webinar recording, a webinar evaluation, and a link to submit your CCA credentials to earn the 1.5 CCA CEUs. This form will also need to be filled out if you are attending the webinar over the phone. Please make a big note that credits often take a few weeks to appear in your account. If it has been more than two to three weeks, please contact my email at julia at partnershipfarm.org. If you are watching this on demand at a later date, please be sure to watch the entire presentation through the GoToWebinar platform and not YouTube to receive credit. A link to register will be provided in the text below the YouTube video recording and on our website, or it will be emailed to you if you have already registered for the webinar. You are provided instructions at the end of the presentation to submit your credentials. And now with the logistics taken care of, I will turn it over to Tom. Thanks, Julia, and thanks everyone for joining us today. The Partnership for Ag Resource Management is an effort of our nonprofit IPM Institute, along with many other projects in agriculture and communities, each focused on using the power of the marketplace to improve sustainability. Our team of 24 is currently working to increase adoption of best practices and improve outcomes in health, environment, and economics, all key elements of sustainability. We write regularly on IPM and other topics for Crops and Soils magazine. Our article on corn diseases is in the latest issue. We also work with pest control companies, hospitals, schools, and other facilities and communities, and with food companies and farmers around the world to improve practices and performance and to communicate those benefits to buyers and the public. Next slide. Our goal with the Partnership for Ag Resource Management is to identify revenue opportunities for ag retailers that help keep our valuable ag resources on cropland, help promote those products and services, and track sales through annual surveys and estimate reductions in losses of nutrients and other inputs that result from these sales, and report sales data back to participating ag retailers for their location and state and regional averages. We work with ag retailers and industry associations to publicize these great contributions through press releases and articles. It's very important to get this positive news out to address misperceptions the public has about agriculture. We're all aware of the water quality challenges we face from the record-breaking algal blooms in the Western Lake Erie Basin to the larger than ever hypoxic zones in the Gulf of Mexico. And we also know that agriculture can make a difference. There are many signs of improvement in the Chesapeake Bay, for example, after a couple decades of focused efforts to identify and implement solutions, including cover crops. Next slide. These two photos show what happens when too much phosphorus gets into the water, feeding blooms of algae which close beaches to swimming, make fishing a challenge, and have also shut down public water supplies. 
The graph on the left shows NOAA annual data on algal bloom severity since 2002. After phosphorus loadings declined sharply in the mid 80s with the advent of reduced tillage, they've increased. And as a result, we've experienced more frequent and severe algal blooms. We know the phosphorus is coming primarily from cropland because of the timing of the loads. They spike during snowmelt and rain events in winter and early spring following fall applications. The lower image is the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Nitrogen losses from cropland is the primary culprit there, and we'll hear more about that today from Lowell. Next slide. Ag retailers have valuable products and services which can help reduce these losses and improve water quality. Here's a list of some of those that can help reduce phosphorus losses, along with some very rough average reductions based on published studies. There's lots of variability in the published numbers based on soil type, slope, proximity of water, and other factors, but these rough averages give us a sense of where we can likely make a difference. Cover crops, soil testing, grid or zone sampling, variable rate application, and custom application are revenue generating opportunities to reduce phosphorus losses. Ag retailers can also let farmers know when a broadcast application has been made so they can get out there and get the application covered avoid application before a heavy rain event, abide by setbacks, and let farmers know when we can see an issue that needs attention, like a tile drain blowout. Applying only enough phosphorus for the following crop rather than the next several crops in the rotation can also make a difference. Today we'll hear a great overview of some of the issues we're facing with nutrient losses with a focus on nitrogen. Next slide. So ag retailers are making a difference. For example, our annual surveys show large increases in variable rate phosphorus application in the Sandusky River watershed increasing from 17% of acres serviced in 2011 to 70% in 2017 and 2016. In 2015, we secured funding for ag retailers to offer a discount on variable rate to, the, to farmers in the Sandusky River watershed who had not used it before. We've expanded to additional watersheds in Northwest Ohio. We've had more than 40 ag retailers participate. Using published estimates, acres of VRT here alone represent more than a million pounds of phosphorus from leaving cropland in the watershed. We need to track and report the improvements we're making so that regulators and the public are aware of these voluntary efforts, using the power of the marketplace to drive improvements. You'll hear more from Julia about some additional tools and resources we have for you to use as we work together to achieve these goals. And with that, I'd like to turn the mic back to Julia. Thank you, Tom. As Tom mentioned, we do have some free resources available on our website, partnershipfarm.org. On the left is our continually updated agronomist handbook available free for download. The handbook includes algal bloom updates, trends in customer product and service adoption, and fact sheets that you can provide to grower customers to increase awareness and awareness of products and services that reduce nutrient runoff. Our phosphorus loss reduction wallet cards are on the right, which can be ordered for free on our website as well. These are a great conversation starter with your grower customers and can serve as handouts in meetings. To date, we have distributed more than 25,000 wallet cards. Our next webinar will occur in November. Stay tuned for the webinar topic. Please note that we take into consideration your suggestions for webinar topics, so be sure to fill out our evaluation form after the webinar. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for PARM updates and industry news. Now we'll get the presentation started with Lowell Gentry, Principal Research Specialist in Agriculture at the University of Illinois. Good morning. Uh, Hi Lowell. It's good to be with you today. Hi. Are we ready to go? I think you just need to switch it to your screen so that we can see your presentation. There it is. Okay, good. 
All right, well, let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, this is uh, a great opportunity for me to share some of our data, some of our ongoing on-farm research. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, timing of nitrogen application, and, and this talk today is going to be uh, focusing on uh, uh, the influence of fall nitrogen application on uh, tile nitrate loss, and then uh, the associated uh, impact on water quality. So on this uh, first slide, uh, I'm showing uh, anhydrous ammonia going on last fall. That's uh, Eric Miller in the tractor. He's a particip uh, participating farmer with us, works on other research uh, on his farm with us, and uh, uh, we use him as a custom farmer. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, agriculture's challenge, which is to uh, uh, increase yields, uh, but yet decrease nutrient loss. And uh, this is the idea of uh, sustainable intensification. And then uh, we've got a long-term river data set of nutrients, and uh, I'm going to show uh, what a year without much fall in looks like uh, as far as impact on the river itself. And then uh, I'm going to feature a replicated tile drainage study that looks at fall in versus spring in versus uh, split applications of nitrogen fertilizer. So I'm going to start with this, uh, this first slide here with world population uh, growth, where we've come from in the last 12,000 years. It's a fairly startling look when you uh, have it here on a 12,000 year time frame, because you can see how quickly population growth has occurred. Uh, currently we're at 7.6 billion people and we're adding 83 million per year. Uh, it was a, a graph like this uh, in a ecology course that I was taking at the U of I in 1980 that got me interested in uh, science and uh, I became an ecology major because of that. But at the time, in 1980, we were headed towards about 5 billion people. And the projection was that we would reach 15 billion people um, in the next uh, 100 years. And uh, that seemed like a, a grand challenge. And so uh, fortunately, uh, these uh, estimates have come down. And uh, now we're looking at, uh, often you hear that we'll reach 9 billion people by 2050. But this graph shows that uh, that's not the end of it. We're gonna continue on heading towards uh, 10 billion or more people. And the most populated areas will be the developing nations. And then to uh, supply enough food to this growing world population, there were estimates from a paper in PLOS One back in 2013 by Ray, Mueller, West, and Foley. They suggested that we were going to have to double world food production of the four major crops before 2050 to be able to feed 9 billion people. Uh, and uh, you can see they, they felt we had to increase the, uh, the, production, the production rates, um, but maybe, maybe it's not as uh, bad as that. In fact, uh, in a more recent paper in Bioscience by Hunter, Smith, Schapansky, Atwood, and Mortensen, they feel those targets are not realistic or it's not necessary to have to double world food production. In fact, they brought it down to that we would just need to have 25 to 70% more food production worldwide. And uh, that's a lot better than doubling. So they suggested that we just need to keep on the trajectory of increase that we currently see. So how are we doing in Illinois for yields? Um, our two major crops being corn and soybean, and we've had tremendous production in the last two years. In 2016, corn production was the second highest on record, and it was the largest soybean yield ever at 59 bushel per acre. And then in 2017, we hit a new record here. The entire state averaged 201 bushels per acre for corn, and then soybean was just down one bushel, but another excellent yield, and it was record production that year. So how are we doing this uh, as far as corn yields? Well, we are adding the same amount of fertilizer we have essentially since 1980. 
So almost for the last 40 years, fertilizer use has been stable at, at uh, around 160 pounds per acre um, for the state. And by definition then, I feel that we have increased our efficiency. And that just means that we're getting greater corn yields with the same amount of N. So uh, clearly the new hybrids are, are either better at taking up nitrogen or better at using it and converting it to yield. But uh, this suggests that uh, farmers have gotten more efficient over time. But then we hear last year we had the largest hypoxic zone ever. So how does enhanced efficiency uh, lead to the largest hypoxic zone? And this hypoxic zone was, already, was estimated to be uh, the largest uh, or one of the largest. And, and the uh, researchers at LSU, that's uh, Turner and Rabelais, they used the May nutrient loads in the Mississippi River Basin uh, in their modeling effort. So there was a very large load headed towards the Gulf in May of last year, and they predicted a large size, and it was large. Well, they, they predicted a, a fairly large hypoxic zone again this year, yet it was a much smaller than uh, expected hypoxic zone size. And uh, they felt that strong winds in the Gulf mixed the water enough and didn't allow the hypoxic zone to reach a very large extent. So, uh, Although their model suggested that it was going to be large, uh, that didn't come to fruition this year, but it was based on a heavy load. So regardless, we had good crop yields the last two years, and yet we're still seeing a large amount of nitrogen and phosphorus headed towards the Gulf. And the EPA put a science advisory board together and has uh, suggested that all states in the Mississippi River Basin need to reduce their nitrogen and phosphorus export by 45 percent. And the, we do have an interim standard uh, that uh, we only have to bring it down by 15 percent for nitrogen uh, by 2025 and uh, 25 percent for phosphorus, all in, with the idea of trying to reduce the hypoxic zone to a target level of less than 2,000 square miles. So Illinois has responded. Uh, they put together a, a, a team for a science assessment. That team was led by Dr. Mark David. Uh, he uh, retired uh, a couple years ago and I was working for him, so I have taken over for him. But uh, he, he put together the baseline data that uh, showed that agriculture is responsible for 80% of the nitrate that leaves Illinois and 50% of the phosphorus. The Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy is a suite of best management practices to address both point and non-point pollution. But agriculture has a, a large task here because 80% of the N can be traced back to uh, production, agricultural production. So why hasn't enhanced efficiency decreased nitrate loss? Well, there is some indication it has, and there was a recent paper by uh, Greg McIsaac and, and Mark David, uh, where they saw that the nitrate in the Illinois River has decreased, and, and that's a, a very large load. It's our largest river. So there's some indication that uh, nitrate load is decreasing, and, and they, they charged that it was an increase in efficiency because of the new hybrids are, are uh, getting higher yield and, and not taking up a, or, or not uh, needing extra nitrogen, same fertilization rate. But there are these critical factors that come into play uh, to disconnect uh, this uh, high yielding efficient situation we have in the field, yet we're still having enough nitrogen and phosphorus head down the Mississippi River to form a hypoxic zone. And the first factor is precipitation, and it's just when and how much. Of course, where matters, but uh, uh, at any location, it's it's when. And and if you get a lot of rain and flow in April and May, uh, there's 
not a lot we can do about that. Uh, often fertilizer is already applied by then. And then temperature is another critical factor. Uh, we seem to be having warmer winters and then uh, we have more mineralization. Warmer winters aren't very good for fall then. Uh, they can convert to nitrate more quickly. So that can be an issue. And then what I'm gonna discuss later today is the timing of unfertilization fall versus spring versus side dress or split applications. And then of course, so the artificial drainage that we've installed throughout uh, Illinois uh, by dredging ditches uh, in the late 1800s and, and installing tile drainage. But in my opinion, tiles are a prerequisite for high yields. We need them in this area. We can't farm as efficiently without them. And we've built in a large capacity to move the water out of these fields very quickly. But unfortunately, tiles are the major source of nitrate to streams. And riparian buffers in this area are not very effective because if the nitrate's already in the tile line, it's just gonna bypass the roots of these uh, riparian buffers and we won't get any benefit. This could help some for erosion purposes and maybe limit phosphorus movement, but these riparian buffers in, in the heavily tile drained areas like uh, here in central Illinois are not very effective for that. And uh, from this aerial view back in the 90s after a five inch rainfall, you can see we have poor natural drainage. Uh, there'd be a lot of uh, marshy land here before settlement. Um, but we do think that by installing tiles, we have sort of moved the needle towards leaching instead of denitrification. So we have probably limited denitrification to some extent and, and leaching of nitrate would be the main way that we lose nitrate from fields to streams. And we're uh, putting in tiles on a pattern now, meaning uh, for example, in this picture, these tiles are on a 50 foot spacing and uh, we're draining the entire field. So in the old days, uh, clay tiles were put in and they were draining random low spots. But now we systematically drain the entire field. And where does most of this tile exist? Well, it's uh, where we were last glaciated. And the Wisconsin glaciation uh, came uh, uh, out of, uh, well, from the north, out of Canada, and uh, it shaped the Great Lakes. Lake Michigan is, uh, is sort of the shape of that lobe and you can see the lobe had expanded and it made it all the way down to Champaign-Urbana, scouring the landscape. Um, I grew up in the northwest corner of Illinois uh, in that mountainous region of Illinois they call the unglaciated area. Um, now this is the extent of the Wisconsin glaciation across the Corn Belt and first we can just look over here towards the west and see this Des Moines lobe which uh, flattened Minnesota and this part of Iowa. There's lots of tiles in that area. And I've already showed you that we have a lot of tiles in this area of Illinois, uh, but the uh, glaciation went right across Indiana, Ohio, and there's lots of tiles throughout that area. And then here's an estimate by county of uh, the percent of land tiled in each of these counties. And you can see it matches up very nicely with uh, that extent of the Wisconsin glaciation. And by no surprise here, this is the area that loses the most nitrate uh, that enters into the Mississippi River Basin. These darkest blue areas are losing 15 to 25 pounds of nitrate nitrogen per acre per year. And I'm gonna show you a watershed uh, closer to home that we've been looking at that, that loses uh, even more than that. And here it is, it's the Ember River which is part of the Wabash River system. Wabash drains much of Indiana. And uh, we're looking at only the upper Embora River uh, watershed. It's, uh, it starts there in Champaign-Urbana and at the base of it here down by Camargo, Illinois is where the USGS gauges the river flow. Uh, this watershed is 119,000 acres. It's very flat, so extensively tile drained. The boundaries of the watershed are moraines. And uh, so those are areas of recharge. But what's really nice about this watershed 
in regard to studying nitrate movement is that there's very few animals, so we don't have to sort out the manure input, and it's 90% uh, row crop agriculture. And uh, there's very little sewage effluent as well that we have to sort out. For example, the sewage effluent from Champaign-Urbana enters a different watershed. So the USGS uses this bridge as a large weir. They know the, uh, the cross-sectional area of the channel and it's the height of the water uh, under the bridge is related to flow. And uh, they've been keeping records or monitoring this, this bridge here, the flow at the Ember River since 1960. Now, we have been taking weekly or as much as daily samples since uh, 1993. And our group has visited that bridge 1,475 times during the past 25 years. And so we've got this long-term data set and, and it's, it's invaluable once you see uh, the, the data that uh, we clearly have uh, the baseline conditions established by having this long data set. And it also allows for the quantification of any environmental change. If, if we're getting wetter or warmer, well, that could change uh, the trajectory uh, of nitrate uh, loss. And uh, we have this good baseline that we can compare it for, uh, compare it to. Also, uh, any land use changes or management changes. For example, if more cover crop were adopted in this watershed, we, we might be able to see a, a change or a reduction in nitrate loss based uh, on a comparison of the first 25 years. And then when you have 25 years of data, you can look for unusual events or, or unusual years. And I'm gonna point one of those out to you here shortly. And ultimately it'll be uh, data for a predictive model. Now here's the USGS flow data from this site. They are the experts at, at getting flow. And uh, so all we have to do is uh, multiply our nutrient concentration data times their flow values to get load. And you can see it's a very flashy system. Uh, we have uh, three very large events of greater than 7,000 cubic feet per second. Um, we have another large event in, uh, oh, that was uh, December of 2015. Uh, this is a very large event here with uh, uh, about five inches of rain coming in April of 2013. But also you can see just how little flow there was in a drought year like 2012 or in 2001. So here's our data, uh, and, and this is a regression of of river flow and, uh, and then river load, uh, the nitrate load. And in general, our flow converted to inches per year is about 13 inches. And let me explain how we get that. So we know the volume of water that goes down the river and uh, we spread that volume out over 119,000 acres and we know the depth. And that depth on average is 13 inches per year. We get about 40 inches of rain here per year. So on average, we uh, one third of the rainfall turns into river flow in this area. Um, and uh, 13 inches is uh, actually 5.7 billion cubic feet per second per year. And uh, just to try and put that on some kind of scale, uh, that amount of water would fill the Empire State Building 150 times in a year. So this just this small creek uh, produces that much water and it carries quite a bit of nitrate and the average nitrate load is 3 million pounds per year. But you can see that's uh, quite low in a dry year, about a million pounds and, and up to 6 million pounds in a wet year like 2002 or 1993. These, uh, dry, these dry years are losing only about 8 pounds per acre per year, where the average is 27 pounds per acre uh, loss every year. And that's every acre in the watershed. And not all of that is farmland. So it's a conservative estimate. So we have a very good relationship between flow and load, which you would expect because flow is the most important factor in calculating load. But we have an R squared of 0.84. 
and that's very good. Uh, and last year fell just about right on the line. So we wouldn't even need to sample the river. All we would have had to do is uh, you tell me what the flow was and I could have used this equation and, and found that value. When we look at these 25 years, we see two years do not fit the line. And one year is 34% above this predicted line. And that's the load that followed the drought of 2012. That drought was considered a 50 year drought. So it was a severe drought in this area. And then we had one of the wettest January through June periods on record. And uh, that produced uh, more load than would be predicted by that amount of flow. So that's really a one, two punch for uh, uh, water quality in this area to have a 50 year drought and then a very wet winter. The other point that's farthest from the line is uh, 2010 and that load is 32 percent below the predicted line and that is a year where very little fall in was applied in this area. It was a late harvest and it was uh, warm in early November and then right at the beginning of the fall in application season. We got an inch of rain for three days in a row and very few people got any fall in applied in this area and that led to this lower than expected load based on the amount of flow. Now here is the nitrate concentration from those 1400 or so samples uh, from 1993 through uh, the water year of uh, 2017. And you can see that uh, every year, except for the very first year, we do get above the 10 part per million drinking water standard. And uh, there are municipalities downstream that use the Ember River as a drinking water supply. So this is a concern for them. And, uh, but the other pattern you see is that every year we go down below one part per million and then back up and down and back up. So this period of low nitrate concentration generally occurs in September and August, uh, August, September and October, uh, when uh, flow is very low and tiles have stopped flowing. So when st tiles stop flowing, the river nitrate quickly goes uh, down below one part per million, again showing the importance of tiles in uh, moving nitrate from fields to streams. Uh, 1993 was unusual. We didn't go down to that low value that we saw all the other years. So the first year was an unusual year. And it was unusual because it was 1993. It was the wettest year on record and tiles never stopped flowing that year. So the river had nitrate throughout the uh, summer and fall. But to look at uh, those two years that didn't fit the line, we can see that uh, sure enough, we had the highest concentrations we've ever had in, in samples uh, in that uh, spring of 2013 following the drought and that flow weighted mean nitrate concentration was the highest in the 25 year period at 11.7. Where 2010 is this cluster of nitrate. Uh, it, we don't have this uh, usual pattern that we, that we normally see. And uh, that was a flow weighted mean nitrate concentration of 5.7, which is the lowest in the period of record here. Uh, the average flow weighted mean is 9.2 for this 25 year data set. So that data was all squeezed together because it was 25 years. Here I'm just going to show one year that was a pretty typical year and, and this is the kind of pattern we generally see through the fall and winter is that we get this steady increase of, of uh, another event and then the baseline is higher and another event and the baseline is higher all the way up into uh, late June. Uh, usually we see the increase and then uh, tiles stop flowing and then it doesn't take long for the nitrate concentration to come back down below one part per million. So this is what uh, the pattern looked like uh, for the previous year and the year after. Uh, and uh, you can see just how different uh, the 2010 water year was. And it's estimated that no more than 10% of the usual amount of fall land went on in this area. And there just isn't any crease 
there's no increase in uh, nitrate concentration until we get the nice on in the spring. And the industry was very concerned that they weren't going to be able to get all the nitrogen on. That has been an argument for uh, keeping fall in as an option, is that uh, it puts a lot of strain on the industry. And uh, unfortunately, in April of 2010, there were uh, a dry period. There were, there were three dry weeks where uh, the entire state was fertilized. And, and sure enough, then when it rained next, we, we see a spike. But What's interesting with this is that it's such an immediate effect. And there's a recent paper that's come out that has suggested that there could be a decadal response to um, conservation efforts. And in fact, they, they're suggesting that we're not seeing improvement in water quality because uh, of this lag time. So conservation efforts have gone in, but there'll be a long lag time with nitrate leaching. And we don't see that. So we contend that in tile drained areas that there will not be a long lag time. So why do farmers put nitrogen on in the fall uh, when uh, we know that it is leakier, uh, there's a chance at losing more N. And uh, the number one reason I think is it reduces the risk of not being able to apply in the spring. And so, um, it's just a peace of mind part of it. I'm sure most all farmers have been burned by the weather before and, and it's often uh, when the conditions are right, it's best to uh, work in the field, um, but also soil conditions are generally more favorable in the fall than in the spring. You get more chances at, at uh, getting the fertilizer put on when it's not too wet or too dry. And also, uh, logistics are an important reason. If a farmer has a really large operation, um, they feel that they need to get some of their nitrogen on in the fall because there's so many acres to cover. And the industry also likes the idea that uh, they can divide their workload up between fall and spring by having fall in be an option. And then uh, we can reduce compaction or avoid compacting the soil by having the nice and put in the fall because often uh, if it is a little wet in the spring and you feel that you know, the need to get the fertilizer on might risk compaction. And here's a reason that I've heard Dr. Emerson Napsiger give is that when the nice put on in the fall, there's more time for it to be dispersed through the soil and therefore it's easier for plant access that next spring. And we found it works very well with strip till. We like strip till on these very flat fields and uh, then the seed is sitting right over top of the, uh, the fertilizer and uh, we have seen some early season responses uh, a benefit to uh, having the seed right over top of the fertilizer like that. And then often there's a better price offered in the fall. We have guidelines for uh, Illinois. So Illinois Agronomy Handbook says that uh, when using anhydrous ammonium, you need to wait until the soil is consistently below 50 degrees Fahrenheit at the four inch level. And the industry is really pushing this idea and, and, and there uh, uh, seems to be good adherence to that. And so farmers are waiting and that's generally about November 15th then when fall in starts to be put on in this area. And again, soil moisture is important. Uh, you don't want to have it too wet or too dry. The, the slip won't uh, close if it's too wet and then uh, the anhydrous ammonia won't have enough uh, water to, uh, to react with if it's too dry. Uh, you do have to knife it in at least six inches deep so it does take some horsepower and a nitrification inhibitor is also recommended. Now in southern Illinois, we do not allow fall in, and it's below the terminal moraine. It's different soil type down there, and it's much warmer. So it's just assumed it's not a good idea to put fall in uh, below Route 16 in Illinois. Um, but uh, this goes on to say that uh, you wouldn't want to put it on very poorly drained areas or excessively drained areas. And then 
with all this tile drainage, I, I, I wonder what is excessively drained. Uh, I, I'm sure they were thinking of sandy soils when this was written. So here is a, an estimate of fertilizer sold um, in the fall for the past uh, oh, about 40 years. And uh, since I've been keeping these records, in fact, and you can see that about half the fertilizer uh, of late is sold between July and December. And the way we get these percentages that we, we have to add the fall fertilizer sales from the year before to the spring sales to get the total annual sales. And so we divide the fall sales by the total annual sales. And you can see that 2010 is much lower than the years uh, around it and that's that year where very little fall end was applied in this area now this is not a perfect metric because not all fertilizer bought in a certain time period is applied at that time so but it's it's about the only metric we have other than uh, surveys but uh, it really i'm showing here uh, this uh, this lack of fall end in 2009. so i want to move on to uh, this featured study here that uh, it's funded by the Nutrient Research and Education Council. That is uh, uh, money that comes from a fee on tonnage of fertilizer sold. And so it's, uh, it is, uh, for, uh, it's farmer paid for research. And uh, the title of that, uh, that study is uh, Nitrogen Management Systems in Tile Drain Fields trying to optimize yields and minimize losses. And we're using the four R's concept here. We're looking at timing mostly, but with timing comes in a different source because our side dress is generally UAN and, uh, and anhydrous goes on either in the fall or in the spring. We do have one treatment where we have a reduced rate, which we keep in there to make sure that we are not over fertilizing. And uh, also we have a cover crop treatment. So it's, it, this experiment is like uh, the four R's plus a cover crop. And I'd like to immortalize our crew here. The U of I crew is Michelle Rolf. Uh, she was an undergraduate that has continued working for us after she's graduated. Corey Mitchell is a lab supervisor who we also have to get out in the field to help uh, with CRI biomass and, and uh, B7 corn biomass. Uh, Luis Andino is our graduate student. John Green is our field technician. And, and this uh, project is very much uh, in cooperation with the industry. Uh, we work with the Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association. Dan Schaefer, he's the uh, Director of Nutrient Stewardship for IFCA. He's invaluable in our study. He, he keeps us on track and, and makes sure that the treatments are put on uh, correctly and at the right time. And often Dan is doing it uh, himself for us. And then his, his assistant is Jason Solberg, uh, who is an absolute soil sampling phenom. So this is a shot of uh, a lot of our, our sampling points on this one farm, where we have this replicated tile drainage study. We use an agri-drain structure to intercept the tile flow. These are uh, four or five feet down below the soil surface. In the bottom of each one of these is a V-notched weir board, and uh, the height of the water over this V is uh, related to flow. We get liters per second. And so we have a pressure transducer placed in each one of these, a submersible pressure transducer that's giving us the height and also the temperature of the tile water, which is very interesting during snow melt events. You can see how quickly water passes through the soil when you're looking at tile temperature. And uh, then we have these automatic water samplers. They sample three times a day, and we pick and choose what samples to save based on the hydrograph of the individual tile lines. And methods are, we have six treatments, six different nitrogen systems I'm gonna go over. And there's three replicates. We have both phases of the corn and soybean rotation. So on this one farm, we're monitoring 36 tile lines, 18 in corn and 18 in soybean. The tiles are 100 feet apart, so our uh, plot size is 50 feet on either side of that tile. So the tile runs right down the middle of the plot. 
but they're rather long laterals. They're about 2,000 feet long. So each individual plot is four acres or, or more, which is really a large size for uh, one of these replicated tile drainage studies. I, I know of no study with larger plots uh, when it comes to uh, looking at tile drainage and linking nitrogen systems to tile loss. We are performing a randomized complete block design uh, in, uh, throughout the study. And uh, a couple of caveats, the study starts in uh, the fall of 2014. That's when we put the agri-drain structures in. And so in the first year, uh, there's no fall in or cover crops planted because we needed a period of, of a baseline evaluation. And the uh, fall in and cover crops were established in 2015 and 2016. This is the tile map of, of that farm. And it's a very unique farm to have that many laterals uh, in parallel arrangement. And so uh, we have uh, either on this part, soy, corn, soy after three years or corn, soy, corn. And so these are three replicates here and these are the other three reps. And within each one of these blocks, the six treatments are randomized. Now here are these six treatments, these various nitrogen systems. Our full rate is 160 pounds, but in the first year we had to put on more because it is second year corn. The entire field before we took it over for research was planted to corn. So 2015 truly is a setup year where we had to use more nitrogen uh, in that year. But uh, after that, our full rate is 160 pounds and we put uh, all of it on in the fall with an inhibitor for treatment number one. Treatment two is half of the nitrogen in the fall with 25% at planting and 25% side dress. So it's a three-way split application. Some thoughts here that we'd be spoon feeding the crop uh, a little bit of N and that might make it more efficient. Treatment three is a full rate of anhydrous in the spring pre-plant without inhibitor. Treatment four is our reduced rate. That's a 75% rate without inhibitor, same time as the, uh, the other spring N. And then treatments five and six have uh, half their N in the spring pre-plant, and then the other half is side dress as UAN. Uh, but treatment six has cover crops, and that's oat and radish uh, following soybean ahead of corn, and then cereal rye after corn ahead of soybean. Here's a view. Uh, that Jason took for us with a drone. He's a drone pilot. And uh, it just gives you an idea of how large each one of these plots are because the, the uh, cereal rye is showing up so nicely in this plot. This was taken in April during one of our floods in 2017. We had a flood like this in April and then another one in May that led to tile loss. And it clearly shows why we need tiles in this area. So looking at the tile nitrate concentration data for the first four months is our baseline period because there's no nitrogen on any of these plots and everything was planted to corn the year before. So we're evaluating the, the variability in these plots and it's really quite good. Now, each dot is the average of the three replicates, but all 36 tiles are uh, represented in this data set and it's very nice to see that the load comparisons are very similar and the concentrations are, are uh, quite similar too. So it was a good start for us to see that we had that kind of consistency. So then the experiment starts at least in 2015 where we, uh, we add uh, spring end only. So any of our fall end treatments, which is there's just the two of them, they were essentially the same as the spring end treatment. So, we had nine reps of uh, 200 pounds in the spring that year. And then uh, you can see once we have nitrogen applied that when it rains, we, we get some nitrate concentration spikes here. But overall, uh, the end loss wasn't significantly more and we didn't lose that much that year. It was a bit of a dry year. And uh, so we lost about 19 pounds versus 17 pounds coming out the tile. That's average across the treatments. So there were no treatment differences this year in that setup here. So this is what a yield row looks like for us. It's two passes with a four row combine. 
And this is right over top of the tile. This is looking 2,000 feet down the, uh, the plot. And at the end of it, you can see this little gray dot, and that's our automatic water sampler at the end. And in this setup year, we did see a yield reduction of corn with the 75% rate. Uh, and uh, our uh, other plots, there was no statistical difference between them, between either all in the spring versus split uh, in the 170 bushel range. Soybean was about 53 bushel per acre that year. Now in 2016, we have the fall end treatments. We have the full suite of treatments here. So uh, we have all six treatments and you can see we do have a statistically significant reduction in yield with the 75% rate, which was 120 pounds because now it's corn after soybean. Uh, but we see no yield increase or decrease. And it's the same yield for all the other treatments. So if we've lost more end with fall end, uh, it's not showing up, it's not giving them a yield hit. And we had fantastic soybean yields that year, 80 bushel per acre averaged across the plots. And in 2017, we're unable to see any statistical difference. I'm learning that it's, uh, it's difficult to get significant differences when you have only three reps, but uh, it's, uh, it was a compromise. We have six nitrogen systems with three reps. We would have had, had, have had less treatments, and I think we're learning a lot with these six treatments. So. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge with our statistics, and we had some wind damage and some green snap, but I'll be so bold as to say that there is a trend for yield loss as we get into spring end and fall end, and, uh, and then uh, 20 bushels less or, or more, uh, 25 bushels less with the uh, reduced rate. And, and uh, soybean was 55 bushel per acre that year. We had a bit of a dry grain fill period, reduced the soybean yield. Now here's the tile nitrate, and you've seen the left side of each of these graphs. So it's the soy corn rotation versus the corn soy. And uh, right away you can see the red and black dots, which are the two treatments that have fall N, separate from the rest of them. You can see we're really quite flat if we don't put any uh, nitrogen on because it's soybean. And that, that reminds me of what we saw in 2010 in the river. Uh, it was just a, a fairly flat nitrate concentration. So it's, it's similar. But when you have nitrogen on in the fall, you see that uh, once winter passes and we get into warmer period, the nitrate concentration increase compared to those plots that do not have nitrogen on. And then the separation is quite obvious here. And uh, the flow weighted mean nitrate concentrations are significantly greater with fall end versus uh, the plots that have either just spring in on or the, uh, the split application. I want to point out here that the oat and radish biomass isn't very much. It winter kills and we're not getting much nitrogen in it. We don't think the oat and radish is having much of an effect on tile nitrate. But if we look on the right side here, this is the effect from cereal rye. So this is the average of the three reps, and it happened to all three reps. Very good uh, winter for cover crops because it was warm. But a flip side of that, a warm winter is not very good for fall end. So all in one year, we had great extremes. We, we had plots that went down to two part per million uh, because of the cereal rye following corn versus we had plots that were averaging over 20 part per million due to fall end uh, application. And here's what that CRI biomass looks like. Uh, we get about one and a quarter tons of above ground biomass and that had about 35 pounds of nitrogen per acre in it. And I'll show you this here shortly, but uh, it seems we're finding that if you can get 30 or 40 pounds of nitrogen taken up by a cover crop, you can reduce the tile nitrate load by almost 10 pounds per acre. So now this is adding the third year, the 2017 year data. So we had to split the two graphs. So this is the soy corn soy rotation. And what I want to point out here is that when we've loaded up the shallow groundwater with nitrate due to this leaching of fall end, it carried over 
and those concentrations, those plots were higher, uh, had higher nitrate concentrations throughout the entire next year. So there is a bit of a carryover that we see. Uh, and again, uh, we plant cereal rye the next year um, on following corn, and we see another nice response, getting the tile nitrate almost down to one part per million. And it looks like the trajectory is, is coming down as well. So just like uh, fall in having a carryover, the beneficial effect of having the cereal rye after corn I had a soybean followed through to the next year and those tile nitrate concentrations stay low all the way until we uh, add spring end to those plots. So that was very nice to see. That was a surprise to see that we continue that good effect. We don't believe that the oat and radish had anything to do with this, this good effect. The oat and radish uh, was essentially a, a failed cover crop. We, we tried to time uh, aerial seeding with a uh, leaf drop, but our, our soybean planting date was a little late and uh, we, our oat and radish really struggled under the uh, shaded uh, uh, soybean plant. So, excuse me, I wanted to point out that here, uh, we don't see that big separation between fall in treatments and spring in in 2017, which uh, was a little bit of a surprise uh, compared to the year before, but we ended up putting our spring in on very, very early. And it was because conditions were so uh, perfect in February. And we noted what, what area farmers were doing and we wanna do what the farmers are doing. So I spoke with Dan Schaefer and I said, well, if everybody's putting their nitrogen on, let's us do it as well. And so we got our fertilizer on February 28th. And our protocol was not to use an inhibitor. And here's what the, the temperatures looked like in February of that year. Very warm across the Corn Belt. It's the warmest February on record, in fact. And so, uh, yes, we put our spring end on, but I put that in quotations because it's really a late winter application without an inhibitor. So uh, it might have been prudent to use an inhibitor if, if the nitrogen was going to go on that early because we had lots and lots of rain in April and May, and there was pro probably plenty of time for that anhydrous ammonia to nitrify before those heavy rains. And what I wonder, well, this happened in the uh, Champaign County area. Um, I know for sure, Champaign and Douglas County. But did that happen across the Corn Belt? Did we all get our nitrogen on early that, that uh, spring? And, and did that contribute to that large hypoxic zone? Because the uh, May River nitrate concentrations were so high, uh, they were expecting a large hypoxic zone. So that's part of that disconnect. We had great crop yields, but our nitrogen went on really early and we lost some of it. So here are the tile loads from the 2016 corn plots. And yes, the two plots that have fallen uh, seem quite a bit higher. And when we do a, a standard ANOVA, which is analysis of variance, I can get significant differences here, but we use this Tukey's pairwise comparison. It's a, it's a much more conservative uh, estimate and we, do not quite get significant differences here. But I'm gonna say that uh, the trend is certainly up uh, and, and we didn't lose that much less by putting only half of the nitrogen on in the fall. That was a little disappointing as well. We do have some statistical differences in 2017. Uh, the reduced rate uh, after uh, a couple of years of having a reduced rate on corn, 2015 and 2017, you see that load is going down. But now spring end is right up there with the fall end loss. And again, that spring end, quote unquote, is really a late winter application. Now that carryover of the beneficial zero rye uh, effect is, is playing into these loads and we get a significant decrease overall, looking at uh, uh, maybe 32 pounds per acre loss there and, and only about uh, 17 pound per acre loss with the 50-50 uh, split with the cover crop. Now looking at the tile loads from the soybean plots, uh, we do get a significant difference and that's because of the uh, cereal rye effect. Um, and uh, 
that represents a 40% decrease in tile load in the very first year. So I don't see any long lag time. CRI was there the year before, it took up 30, 40 pounds and, and it reduced the tile load comparing its uh, companion treatment um, by just about 10 pounds per acre, which would move us pretty far in the direction of uh, what the nutrient loss reduction strategy for the state would like to see. And then that carryover uh, of the fall and the next year wasn't significant, but you can see here it is higher. Um, and uh, over time, we probably will get uh, greater uh, clarity on significant differences on these treatments. Uh, this is a really nice way to look at all six treatments at once. This is a cumulative tile load graph over the past two years. So we're leaving 2015 out since that was the setup here. So we start when the tiles start flowing in, in uh, November of 2015. And uh, you can see as, it, as the lines are a little squiggly and going up, these are individual events. And then this would be tile flow stopping and then tile flow resuming. And you can see here that in just two years, we have very nice separation of the six different nitrogen systems out there. In fact, it's a 43% decrease from the 100% of the nitrogen in the fall versus the 50-50 spring and side dress with a cover crop. And we're looking at about 54 pounds per acre loss, so that would be 27 pounds per acre, very similar to what we see in the river. So this study is doing a very nice job of, of uh, uh, letting us understand what's going on on a field basis so that we can compare it to what we see in the river. And I meant to mention that this site is uh, really quite close to that USGS site where we've been visiting for the past 25 years. It's about 10 miles away. But just in two years, we get this separation and it's what you would expect that the fall end plots have lost the most and the plots with cover crop have lost the least. Spring end is right in the middle, but this is interesting to show that uh, the reduced rate loss is down, but it's about the same as when we put the full rate on, but split it. And I think that's really important. It's not all about just uh, over fertilizing. Our nitrate problem is not just about over fertilizing, it's about timing when we put the fertilizer on. So here's my list of cons for fall in application, and it's shorter than the list for pros. There's more positive things you can think about with fall in than, than the negatives, but the, uh, the negatives are are certainly something to consider. Uh, corn yields are rarely increased and may be reduced. Now, if corn yields were reduced more regularly with fall end use, fall end application would probably just simply go away because the economics would drive it. Uh, I have never personally seen a yield increase due to fall end. Uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible. Maybe a dry spring could change something like that and where you have uh, the nitrogen on already, it may have been dispersed through the soil better, but I personally haven't seen a yield increase. If anything, it looks like you might get a yield decrease. Now the second con is clearly uh, an important one is that you're gonna have increased risk of nitrogen loss. If you think about when nitrogen goes on in this area, in mid-November or up until say uh, mid-December, if the soils aren't frozen, that's six or seven months before the crop needs it. So there's a lot of time for exposure to loss processes, both leaching and denitrification. So I think uh, another con is just we're, we've got decreased efficiency. It has to be decreased efficiency, even though it, it doesn't always reflect uh, a loss of N in yield, we are losing more nitrogen if we put it on in the fall. And uh, we see this happening more often, or at least this is, uh, predicted for the future that we're gonna have more of these uh, very large rain events. And this is an example of one in April that I pointed out earlier on the USGS hydrograph where we had five inches of rain in April of 2013 and, and fall end would have been moving. And, and uh, here's an example of a nitrogen that's still safe. It's still in the tank. It wasn't put on yet before all this rain. So I think it best to wait until closer to when the crop needs it. But, but we're not losing that much. We're only talking about 10 pounds per acre. 
out of 160 going on. So from a farmer standpoint, it's not that much nitrogen loss. And that's why yields uh, don't reflect that loss. So in summary, uh, corn yields may be similar with fall in, however, more tile loss. Again, that's to me a lower efficiency. And in a warm, wet winter, uh, fall in application can contribute as much as 30% of the Nitrogen River load. Uh, we clearly saw that with our long-term data set and the, the uh, replicated tile study seems to bear uh, the same kind of numbers. Uh, here's my last point. Reducing fertilization rate decreased tile load, but also decreased crop yield. Whereas the split application then decreased the tile load, but did not reduce crop yield. So I often hear people say that nitrate loss from ag fields is this idea of just excess fertilizer. And when you say excess fertilizer, it sounds to me like over application but it's not necessarily over application. It's the timing of when fertilizer is applied. It's, it's very important uh, in this whole process uh, for understanding nitrogen loss. So with that, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, the Nutrient Research and Education Council, uh, are the uh, major funder of the study I talked about today, but we did get some recent funding from uh, Food and Foundation uh, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, that's FR. They've given us uh, money, so now we're doing more plant and soil measurements, and we're also looking at uh, the other macronutrients, phosphorus and potassium. And we do have uh, some USDA money to look at phosphorus and tile lines as well. So here's some recent journal articles, and uh, the fourth one listed here is uh, the paper that we put in the Journal of Environmental Quality. Uh, with the long-term data set and, and documenting the year without fall end and, and what it did to the rivers. So I'm adding two bonus slides here before I move on to questions because uh, I heard Tom talk about phosphorus. And so uh, here is phosphorus out of those same samples that we collected over the past 25 years. I just want to point out that five of the six highest phosphorus concentrations in the river occur following snow melt. And I find that very interesting. Um, now the loss is, is far less than one pound per acre. And that phosphorus will be a challenging uh, nutrient to try and reduce by 45% because we're losing a very small fraction of it, but it's, it's important to uh, receiving downstream water bodies. But it's interesting to see that uh, snow melts uh, are the uh, source of very high dissolved phosphorus going down the river. So if anything, I suggest don't put any fertilizer on top of snow, but this still might just be the, the, uh, uh, the product of having phosphorus broadcast on the soil surface prior to snow, and then the snow moving it when it melts. And then just to show that we can pick up a trend over 25 years. This is uh, sulfate in the Embro River, and it has steadily decreased. And I'll bet some of you folks in the audience uh, know why this is. And, and it's because we've, we've moved to cleaner coal or we were uh, scrubbing the sulfur uh, out of the uh, coal power plants and we're in an attempt to reduce acid rain, which has been reduced. We're also losing our free sulfur fertilizer that we used to get. So I think this sort of shows that we're gonna be probably in the market for adding sulfur fertilizer. It was just nice to show that we can pick up a trend and, uh, and over the 25 years, sulfur has dropped from uh, about 13 down to seven, just about in half. So just a couple bonus slides I wanted to throw in there. So that's all I have today and, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Lowell. We're very fortunate to have all of this valuable information available to us today. We do have some time for Q&A, so attendees, please enter your questions into the question box on your screen. And the first question we're going to ask is, do you see egg retailers in your area selling split applications effectively? What do we need to do to sell more of that service? Well, that's a good question because uh, I may not have my finger on the pulse uh, 
with uh, the fertilizer dealers as much as um, my uh, my colleagues there at IFCA, but um, it, it's just it's interesting to know when I think of Dr. Nafziger's uh, research over the many years, and he's looked at when to apply fertilizer, and he's tried many split applications. He generally comes up with the same yield. Um, you don't normally see a yield loss with fall N sometimes, but we know that we're losing more N. So it's just data like this that we're just now producing that would show that there's this added benefit of split application that we really didn't know. It's not necessarily a yield benefit, but it reduces N loss. So um, I am very much now in favor of uh, split application of spring and uh, side dress. Um, I need to get this data out uh, and, and this opportunity right here is, is a way to do that. Um, I do give lots of uh, farmer dealer meetings in the winter time and, and have been uh, slowly getting the word out and uh, I think that's the only way to do it. Well, other than uh, me uh, publish this data as soon as I can and put out a press release. But uh, I think it's it's the way to go. Uh, I used to think that, well, just putting it on um, just pre-plant right before or a very, very early side dress would be good enough as well. But now that I see that tile nitrate uh, is reduced when we only put half of it on in the spring and then the other half on in season. I think that's the way to go and we just got to get the data out. Definitely. Okay, next question is, do you think there will be regulations on fall and application or tile installation first? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, we just went through uh, the exercise. I think there was a lawsuit in Des Moines and uh, part of it was on the grounds of uh, tiles are really point sources not non-point sources. And uh, that was defeated. Uh, if that would have occurred, then then, uh, then I could have seen uh, maybe some drastic problems for, for uh, agriculture. But uh, since that is now off the table, I think uh, we have to be thinking that regulation may be headed our way. But, but I remain somewhat uh, optimistic that voluntary efforts could make a difference. And if we try more cover crops or, or, or less fall in, uh, I think we're moving in the right direction. But so if we can show that we're moving in the right direction, that we're improving water quality, I don't think the absolute reduction is as important as that, look, we're heading in the right direction, give us more time, technology is evolving. And, uh, and I, I think that Farmers will have more time to to uh, do these voluntary efforts and, and try and, and get the uh, concentrations uh, down in their tiles and then hopefully less in in the rivers. So uh, I think uh, I think we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of research yet we need as well. So it'd be nice to gather more research before we get regulated as well. I I, I would. If we're going to be regulated, I hope it's very smart regulation. Okay, and last question is, can you say more about the long lag time in improvement in end losses predicted by some experts versus the results you showed here where end losses dropped fairly quickly? Yeah, I think they must have been looking at a lot coarser scale, a lot larger scale, and maybe they're looking at the entire Mississippi River Basin and, and maybe out west there is a longer lag time. But here in Illinois where we have all this drainage capacity installed in our fields, it happens very quickly. And so we, we need to take the field data and move it to a watershed. And we have a proposal that's being circulated. We, we're uh, looking at nitrate concentration in several watersheds. We've got long-term data sets on three watersheds locally. And one of them has a very nice uh, nested uh, uh, sub-watershed. And if we could get all the farmers in that sub-watershed to try cereal rye after corn and let the other half of the watershed be business as usual, we'd have this paired watershed comparison. 
and it's an 80,000 acre watershed. It'll be a big uh, to do to get to everybody on board with this in that sub watershed. But if we could show that uh, uh, lack of fall in or, or the addition of zero rye after corn could make a difference in a watershed of that size, I think that uh, EPA would, would take note of that and, and see that we're moving in the right direction and, and we have the potential to make this difference. So I, I remain very optimistic about nitrate uh, uh, reductions, meaning I think we can make great strides in reducing our nitrate loads leaving the states. I think phosphorus is going to be a, a greater challenge because it's such a small amount of loss compared to the fertilizer put on and uh, there's very little yield impact to phosphorus loss, yet very low concentrations, maybe two orders of magnitude less than nitrate are significant. So uh, that's gonna be a real challenge. And uh, I guess we need some more research uh, on, on phosphorus loss as well. Okay, in the interest of time, I'd like to wrap up the Q&A. I want to thank Lowell again for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And at this time, I want to recognize our participating egg retailers. If you are an egg retailer in either the Great Lakes Basin or Mississippi River Basin that is interested in participating with PARM to benefit your business and surrounding water quality, please contact our outreach coordinator at Caitlin at partnershipfarm.org. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge our funders, collaborators, and members that made this webinar possible. In particular, the Great Lakes Protection Fund, the McKnight Foundation, Clean Lakes Alliance, and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We've also been enrolling corporate members to support our partnership, so we'd like to highlight our members, the Andersons, a gold member, and silver members, Gerti Egg Services, LLC, and Crop Production Services. Their contribution helped make this webinar possible and helps promote the strides that egg retailers like you are making to reduce nutrient impairments. If you are interested in becoming a member and receiving the additional benefits included, please visit our website, partnershipfarm.org, to fill out our online form. As we wrap up, Please remember to look for the email in a few days with a webinar evaluation, webinar recording, and a link to submit your CCA credentials to earn the 1.5 CCA CEUs, only if you have not already done so during registration. I want to thank you all again for joining us today and hope you join us again for our next webinar in November.